talk to you guys about um, some commonly misunderstood rules in basketball officiating. Um, quick background, professionally I work in operations management for a large public school district called the ISD. Uh, retired from on the court officiating five years ago and have been doing video review since then for the Southeast Conference, Big 12, American Athletic, Sun Belt, and um, a few other smaller leagues. I had a support, uh, SEC men's and women's actually. So I've enjoyed that, I had a nice run, also worked uh, at the high school level for many years and uh, did some football for 10 years as well. So um, uh, I have a pretty good presentation here we'll, we'll go over and if you have any questions and we'll touch on some fundamentals also of uh, basketball officiating so you can get a better understanding of, uh, yeah, they have those copies, you can get a better understanding of what you're going to experience on the court. Okay? Um, so commonly misunderstood basketball rules. Uh, first, first slide, commonly misunderstood. The ball bounced over his head. That's a carrying violation. Well, there's no uh, height limit uh, or restriction on how, how, how high the ball can go um, or how many steps the offensive player takes while he, while he is dribbling the ball. For us to have a violation, the ball must rest in his hand by rule. Okay? So you'll see a high dribble and the crowd will go crazy. And in fact, one of our criteria in video review uh, is that we go back and double check any bench player or crowd reaction play that there was no call on. Okay, and Royce will tell you the same thing. The crowd is not always right, and even the benches and coaches aren't right. He's seen enough film to probably you know admit that. Okay. Um, Hey ref, that's a foul. The defender must give the shooter room to come down. Uh, Royce's team took, took a lot of charges, so if a defender is in place before the offensive player goes up or does not move underneath an airborne offensive player, it's a legal defensive play. Royce, chime in if you want. It's taught at a, at, in the more successful programs to establish a position. Um, I think the slide will also, in a few minutes, progress into uh, when a defender can and can't move. Okay? And any questions, uh, let me know as we go through this. Since we don't have a, a huge crowd, we can do that. Um, that's a blocking foul. Here's another, here's another misnomer. The defensive player was moving. And these are judgment uh, calls by an official. Um, uh, tough to argue, and, and you see more review now in uh, collegiate basketball, whether or not they get to at the high school level, I don't know, probably not, but they may, but play, judgment calls are not reviewable. They don't go to check and see if a guy was fouled, okay? Now, at the collegiate level, they can go and see if there was an intentional foul, okay? Um, so basically, they can walk up the penalty, okay? So we can go from a common shooting foul to, uh, to a flagrant foul. Flagrant, flagrant one or flagrant two, flagrant two at the collegiate level, they would, they would be ejected. Okay. Okay. I have a question. You, wait until the you, end. you can ask now since we're on these slides. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah go ahead. Uh, so, real quick, on the, the block, we get a lot of calls against my team. And I'm, I'm trying to get them to move their feet. But nowadays, you get the guys who will drive in and literally put the ball underneath in a football pose and uh -huh. drop their shoulder, go right in your chest, knock you out of the way. We're getting okay. called for blocking on that. Okay. What do you look for as a ref? to determine whether the defender had good defend, legal defensive position or not. As a, as a general rule, here to here should be an offensive foul. Okay. So if you're square to the three-point line, if you're parallel or parallel to the three-point line and they hit you there, that's good defensive and, and, position. And you got to think about it. If a guy's getting hit in the upper torso, he got there. Okay. Yeah. There are some exceptions. And again, as you progress and the players get more and more athletic, sure. they, those plays are very hard to, to, to officiate, but the general rule of thumb is here to here contact, offensive foul. Lower torso contact, blocking foul, and you'll see it. If the guy, if, if a defender's displaced, yeah. he, he got there, okay? Going back to the slide, the, de the defensive player was moving. A defender is allowed to move laterally uh, and, and vertically and to retreat. So if a guy is coming in like, like you're describing, it should be an uh, uh, offensive foul. Okay, and you should reward good defense. It's the same on a block shot. We should be re rewarding good defensive play, not calling fouls 
and that's another criteria when I review games. Uh, there's actually four criteria. There's correct call, and I find most of the time the officials are right when they when they have a whistle. Um, there is incorrect call, which I don't see a whole lot of incorrect calls in the games I review. Um, I reviewed 100 games, 2017, 18, and 18, 19. I did like 50, um, and on average, do about 25 to 30. But the third criteria is uh, no call incorrect. Those are the ones they want us to look for because there's been a big push to clean the game up and to call more fouls at the collegiate and high school level. They want illegal contact. They want a whistle on it. They want it enforced. Okay? It puts the, the offensive team at a disadvantage when you have a team that is fouling and the officials aren't calling it. The last criteria is no call correct. Okay, That would be a scenario where a guy was in legal guarding position, had verticality. You could have some pretty I would say not even marginal contact that could be deemed a play on, okay? So, um, good question. Uh, so the defender is allowed to move, okay? Real quick, uh, yes, sir. the first criteria is still that the defensive player has to establish a guarding position, though, right? Correct. Okay, Okay. but, but again, the exceptions being, um, and I don't want to get misquoted here, especially on camera, but, but he is allowed to, to, move, to move laterally, okay? Um, uh, and to, to retreat as well as to be uh, to be vertical. To be vertical. And if a guy comes in and clears him out, especially any move by the offensive player to to create space should be an offensive foul. A good play now that they want you to, to referee is the, the offensive player's leg kicking. It's an offensive foul. And it should be officiated as such. I mean that's putting the defender at a huge disadvantage if he's in good condition. I mean, and an offensive player kicks him. There's, there's a lot of plays out there, especially on the internet. Um, he can't pass the ball to himself. That's traveling. Um, a player can literally fumble the ball all the way down the floor if it's legally uh, interpreted to be as such. Now, this course it doesn't happen that much, but uh, there is a difference if, in my judgment, he, he passes it to himself. But a guy can fumble the ball and go recover it, okay? Um, uh, same as a, a shooting an air ball. I don't think that's a slide in here, but if it's a legitimate shot, a player can go and get it and shoot it, uh, dribble it, do whatever he wishes. Okay. You see that a lot? Yes. In, um, I'm talking about uh, when you're, um, what were you talking about first before the legal shot? Um, the leg kick? The late no, first thing you said. Your first one, train of thought. The first slide, Royce. Yeah. Uh, the first one we, we talked about the carrying violation. Then we went to. No, no, uh, right before you. Defender must give the shooter room to come down. No, I'm done. Mishandling the ball down the court. Yeah, mishandling the ball down the court. You see the kids doing this all the time. Boxing out, so they don't. They can just go pick it up. Absolutely. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, know. They don't know. No, uh, and coaches don't know. And, and and that's the one thing they don't know. They coaches don't boxing out. You can pick up any loose ball, and, and pick it up, and it's not a walk. True. And also the key here is there are officials who don't know the rules. So you'll see some of the stuff I'm telling you that are commonly misunderstood that are going to be adjudicated incorrectly. Um, and uh, my advice to anybody getting into coaching uh, or who's been in it is to be patient and be, be a pro. Um, you're not going to get anywhere, especially with some of these guys. I, I wasn't eavesdropping, but I overheard you. Probably ran into some guy who had an ego. He's probably working four, five, six games in a row, and may have an ego before that as well. So he's not going to be any better after four or five games. Neil and I had some dialogue about some officials as well. But uh, being approachable, being being professional, is something that is drilled into all officials. But um, it's not an easy thing to do for some people. So. Uh, and you're going to have conflict. Okay, coaches and officials, I mean, that's never going to go away. Okay, it's hard to teach a young official how to handle conflict. Uh, some are better than others. Uh, some get better than others at it. Some are, you know, going to be terrible at it their whole refereeing careers. But I know myself. I was a real hothead when I was a young official, um, and it hurt me. So. But coaches, I think it starts. 75% of all the conflicts start the coaches can never stop. 
They never shut up. Yeah. And then, so you as a person, if I never shut up, you're going to have a different attitude toward me. Correct. You know, if I... Yes, it's true. Um, and I always tell officials I do a lot of instructing. The less you say, the better. Coach, you got a legitimate question? Okay, coach your team and let us work. Okay. Um, uh, but to, especially if they're getting on you just to get on you. Um, but uh, you also have to keep in mind as an official, it's how these guys make a living. Um, especially as you move up. I mean, at the major college level, you got to coach making you know, three, four, five million. What? Dino makes ten million? I don't know. It's a lot. Josh Pashman from King of High School does pretty well. So um, it's their livelihood. Our officiating position is not what we do to pay all the bills. So give them a, you know, give them a, a little bit of listen. So let's see. Hey ref, that's a foul. The defender is reaching in. Well, the defender can reach in as long as there's no contact that is by rule a foul. Okay? We're gonna get into hand checking here in a minute, which is a big point of emphasis to clean up, as well as illegal defender post play. The reach around reaching <clears throat> thoughts on you we see it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Somebody drives by. Yeah, I think one of the first players I remember seeing him do that and did it pretty good was Rob Williams at U of H, tremendous player from Milby High School. Didn't play a lot of defense. Royce probably saw him play, but he did the old reach around. You know, again, as long as it's not a foul. Yeah, they reach around to hit your arm or your Yeah, it's a foul. Some, right. some kids can are really, really good at it. Yep. They are. I didn't I didn't teach it. I mean I, I in fact if you reached around you're giving up moving your feet, mm -hmm. and so I would get onto the kids or pull them out for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But every once in a while, you got Freemeyer, Jonathan Freemeyer, if he went for it, he got it, and it was a turnover. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we would get a steal every time he did it. So it's, some kids are really good at it. I think the big plays, I again, when I'm uh, looking at plays and instructing officials, any time a defender gets behind an offensive player, an offensive player goes down, you probably have a case for a foul. They don't typically, traditionally, trip up, really at any level, on themselves. They also don't fake it and poke in the eye. Okay. I know there's more acting that goes on nowadays, but those are some key uh, points that I tell officials. When a player goes down and there was a defender behind him, they probably fouled him. If you didn't see it, you were out of position. And we certainly don't guess. It's one of the fundamentals I have, which I'll go over at the end. But um, those are things to keep in mind. Okay. Um, the throw, the thrower in moved. Okay, that's a violation. Uh, an offensive team has been given disposal of the ball for the throw in, be it at the baseline, sideline, far end. If he has a designated spot throw in, which is not the freedom to run the baseline, he actually has a it's a it's a three foot box. He basically got a step in each direction, so he can move. Uh, I was actually working a Division One game one time, and the referee called travel on throwing out of bounds. I mean, and nobody said anything. So I was just like, okay, uh, you know. And the guy going to his grave thinking he got it right. So as an official, you have to constantly be able to learn. Guys that work at the NBA level, collegiate level, high school level, if they're not open to getting better and learning about plays, uh, it's the same as a player. Same as whatever you do, Royce will tell you, Neil will tell you as a coach, as a professional, whatever you do, you can never stop learning. And it's so true of officiating. So he does get his he does get a designated spot to move. You'll see. You can actually move your feet then. Oh yeah, yeah. You can. I just thought it was like a walk. No, you have a three foot box. Okay. You can. I don't think there's a restriction. Well, I don't think there's no restriction in our, how far back I can go. I had that happen at a uh, it was an AAU game. T.J. Ford was coaching. Well, the guy went back probably about 10 feet, but there was nothing there but an empty court. And I told him, and he was going crazy. I said, there's no restriction on that by rule where he can go. So, um, anyhow, um, he has a three-foot box. And if you see the three
okay, or lower torso on the block charge, which is a big play, big key play. It can swing the whole minimum, uh, whole momentum of a game, okay. Uh, trust your partner as an official. I, I want to trust Neil's my partner. I want to trust him to get the plays in his primary, okay. Uh, we officials have primary, be it two or three person. Uh, that's not to say, hey, Neil call something in front of me. It was an obvious play. I missed it. I'm going to tell him thanks for helping me out. Okay, I'm not going to have the ego. Now, if Neil does that 20, 20 times a game, I'm going to have a problem with it. Okay, he's not trusting me. Uh, but officials miss plays every single game. Okay, and that's something you should know. And uh, it's a hard thing, Royce will tell you, for coaches to get used to. They probably never get used to it. But that's why they're always in search for the better officials who work the better, higher level games <clears throat> because they make fewer mistakes. Okay. Stay in your primary follows in with trusting your partner. I want to stay in my little piece of the pie. I don't need to be called in front of Neil. Okay. He's got his own section of the court and I have mine. All right. There's dual coverage areas which can be up on a shot where he may have a better look at it, but I want to trust him. Okay. And I want to stay in my primary. Okay, I get out of my primary on a big game-busting type play that I feel is, a, is a, maybe a better official. I've seen it, and I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going I'm to live and or die with the consequences of it if I got it right. Okay? Sorry, can you just kind of go through what the primaries actually are for the different positions? On the court? Uh, yeah, let me, let me uh, you, you may want to move your camera. I'll try to get a court drawn here. It's pretty easy. I'll do two and three person. So, lead, trail, uh, for the most part, the lead has this area here, okay? It's the lane, free throw lane all the way down, but you do get into some dual coverage areas here where he may walk into a stack of players and not see it, okay? Um, that's when trail can get something, especially anything up high and I always say above the rim type play. It's very difficult for this official to see it, okay? This position also should, should key in and focus on finding the rebounders that are gonna hurt them, okay? Um, uh, tough for lead to see over the back unless there's just a blatant push. Okay. But not always. Again, plays are case by case. Um, so again, for the most part, Trail's got all this. And, and the old lead, we used to move all the way over, back and forth. Um, you don't see a lot of two-person mechanics now, except in some of the games that you guys are going to have at the, at the you know, uh, developmental level. Uh, I call it the AAU level. Okay. I think it's rare you'll see three officials. So down here, we're going to throw in three officials. Okay. you got your lead, your trail, your center, okay? Men's and women's differ a little bit, but for the most part, you're gonna have this. This is the best seat in the house, man. The center official, he goes free throw line to free throw line. He has the best look at everything. It's the best place to be. I love the center position. And as I got older, I didn't have to run as much. So, basically the court is cut in half, okay? Center has all this, okay? And then trail and lead, uh, comes out to here. Some of the high school associations differ a little. This can be some dual coverage area, but again, for the most part, the lead got what's in the lane, and the trail has this out here. And then you got some dual coverage areas. Um, at the collegiate level, for many years, they wanted two whistles on plays, which I guess reinforced the uh, believability that the crew was right. Now, they want one whistle, not so many double whistles, so the officials focus on staying in their area of responsibility, okay? So again, when we talked about trusting your partner, I don't need to be coming in here, call, Neil don't need to call backcourt in front of me, uh, you know, uh, things like that. So, <clears throat> shot clocks, the outside guys have them. Uh, I won't get into real big detail, but shot clock and game clock, typically your outside officials, your trail and center will have the game and shot clock, the table opposite has uh, shot clock, the table side has game clock, but these guys have secondary 
responsibility on both of those as well, in case the other one misses it. Um, lead, if, lead can come out and get it if nobody else did it, but that would be, again, a real rare situation. At the collegiate level, they have replay now for that. Okay. Uh, I won't go into all the replay situations. They do have replay for most uh, change of three to a two, um, ramp up a foul from a common foul to flagrant. Okay, if you got a guy that goes down, benches, they're going to go and review it and they can walk it up. They almost always will 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 have a uh, signal of a, of a you know common foul and they're going to go and review it to walk it up. Okay, they're probably going to know what it is. They're going to confer also what they're doing. Hey, Neil. I thought the guy got hit above the shoulders. It was not basketball. We're going to look and see if that's what it is. Okay, got it, Steve, and whoever our other partner is. We're going to talk about what we're going over there for before we go to it. Um, so, uh, out of, uh, last two minutes of a the game, they'll review any out of bounds. I don't know why they don't do it for the whole game, but they, they, they will review out of bounds plays under two minutes if there's any question. If it's a can of corn, they won't. Um, but those are shot clock and game clock. Uh, uh, obviously, end of, uh, end of half situations on the clock. And, and of course, shot clock violations um, and game clock, game ending, they'll, they'll review those. Okay. All right. Um, call the obvious. This is big. If you got guys, guys going down, you need to have a whistle on the play. Or ladies, okay? Uh, we can't let them to. You can't let them foul, okay? An obvious foul has got to be called. That's a big, 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 big uh, fundamental. And then here's a good one I saw at an NBA camp one year. They had, these, are the, these are the four, they call it Don Shea's motto, but the NBA guy put this one in. Don't guess on plays, okay? Uh, it's a good rule of thumb, but don't guess. So, um, uh, any questions uh, as we wind up here, okay? The young guys got to Long career ahead of you. Uh, coach, wish you luck. Voice is retired. I don't get on the court that much anymore, but uh, uh, thanks for having me. So one, one other question about the primary. Do they still teach the officials that the play coming towards them is their primary, or is that not something they focus on as much as? So you're saying, like, the ball, I got a dribbler out here. You want to go two-man or three-man? Does it really matter? Two. That's what we, that's what most. You're going to face two. Yeah. So you got a dribbler here. It's going to the lane, uh, it, it, you know, it'd be a jump shot or a shot or he passes off and dumps. I mean, it's probably going to be lead's play. The lead official calls a significant amount of fouls. Um, they want the outside guys to get more involved than they are, but, you know, sometimes lead can, can, can control and dominate the game, okay? But so much is coming at them. That's why we got guys switching. Switching means after I call a foul, I'm going to go out, Neil going to come down low, and I'm going to go out top. That way we're not stuck in the same position. Okay, all right. What you see at the A, at the lower, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders is a, is a guy that's walking down the floor. That's sure. what you see. Yeah. I'm trailing. I'm walking down the floor, and I call the foul 70 feet ahead of me. You know, yeah. and there was a guy under the bucket. <laughs> he got zero believability. He was walking. Yeah, under exactly. a call on the strip on the way up. Here. That's a big thing. Officiating is a uh, it's a perception business. Uh, uh, the more athletic guys, uh, they look the part. Okay, you got a good uniform. Okay, to show up out there and you're overweight and and you uh, need to shave and your shirts hanging out and you got spots on your clothes. Your shoes look like crap. You don't you don't look like you don't look the part. Okay. Very important to officiate to look the part, to get up and down the floor, to hustle, and to get in position and work hard because these plays, y'all's plays, are important to you guys. Every single play is very important. I know there's a lot more games now than ever, but the the the, the plays are important. So that's a that's a that's a good question. Uh, one more. You knew I was going to ask this. So yeah. can you go over the rule for correctable errors? Correctable errors. There are five of them. Okay. Failure, failure to award a merited free throw, which means I I screwed up and didn't let him shoot a one and one. Okay, all right. It was seven fouls. Table didn't notify us. Still no excuse as a referee. I should know. Okay, so that's one. 
The second one is awarding an unmerited free throw. Okay? That means I put him at the line and there were only six fouls. Okay? We're going to go over what happens in those scenarios. Okay? Uh, awarding, uh, I, know, I, know, I know I have four of these. Awarding, a, uh, counting a score or not counting it. Um, Three, four, 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 two. Yeah, that would be that would be the score also. Um, uh, failure to award merited free throw, unmerited free throw, counting or dis discounting the score. Okay, I believe I'm gonna have to look those up. Why Is it a foul? Who the, who the foul was applied to? Um, you can correct that any time. Uh, give me a second. I'll, I'll I think we can look it up, but we'll. Uh, I'll have to apologize for that one. I don't have the rulebook handy. But on these correctable errors, you must correct them before the next dead ball. So if we come down and I didn't award your free throws, okay, and you throw the ball out of bounds, the stop the horn, and the table says, okay, we need to shoot his free throws. Okay, no problem. We've, we've discovered it in time. If we throw the ball in play, and then they notify us on the next dead ball, it's too late, okay? If we put you at the line, and we should not have put you at the line, same thing goes, okay? Um, next dead ball, okay, is the general rule of basketball scores count, okay? So apologies about the uh, corrected errors. Um, I knew you were going to ask it. think of it as soon as I leave here, because I've screwed them all up. There's, there's five There's five of them. So, anyhow. Anything else? What advice do you give for the young, eighth, ninth grade players in interacting with the referee? Um, so, they get called for, trying to coach them on, if they get called for a foul and they don't understand why, what's the best way to approach without seeming, uh, without properly challenging yeah, you know, the best thing to do is to just always be a gentleman, be a pro. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, Roy's probably told his kids, you know, don't stay away from them because you don't know what's going to happen with a teenager and an adult. Uh, you know, I, I told them, don't interact with them. Yeah. Period. Yeah, I think the best thing. Don't interact with them. Yeah. The That's best thing, job. Yeah, yeah, the best thing to do is let the coach handle all the interaction, the disagreements, but uh, you don't know what is being said. There are some officials, again, who, who have short fuses. Uh, you know, quite frankly, some of them shouldn't even be out there. At least not very good kids. So, I think mean, the best thing to do is just to have them uh, don't voice displeasure, anything that's demonstrative, creating a spectacle. Of course, you know, talking back. And, and unsporting conduct is off the freaking chain right now. Uh, one of the things I, I, every coach I talk to, they don't like about off-season AU basketball. And there's... Thousands of great guys. Project Hoops is a great program. But you guys teach it the right way. But there are some that don't. Hell, it takes them six to eight weeks to get these kids back in line when school starts. And even then, they're probably liable to go, uh, you know, go off off uh, when they shouldn't be. So the um, best thing is just to be a pro and, you know, here you go, ref, and, and not voice any displeasure. Because you get a technical foul. Yeah. I was just made them. You know, if the ball rolls over there, the referee should never have to go get it. Yeah. You know, those are their referees are just like humans. That's what I tell them. They're the human beings. If you're if you're nice to them, you know, and treat them with respect, you go shag down that loose ball, run down there and go get to the referees, then you know they they have a different there's they, they just they act different towards you. They do come and talk to you at times when you need to. But if you're that person that's gonna Throw your arms up, or or every time there's a foul, just uh, you know react to it. Then these guys are humans. They, they they throw a technic they'll throw a technical foul quicker than they normally should, or they make a call that you think you know because they're human. Yeah, we had to play in the Tassie game. I was thinking about that today. That Coach Castles, one of the greatest guys ever, says nothing. Royce doesn't say a whole lot. We had a play, Jordan, what was Jordan's name? 
over Texas. Harris, oh, Jordan. Jordan, when he got hit and the kid went crazy. <laughs> the game's on the line. I sit there going, Jordan McGowan? Yeah, he didn't just do that. I'm back at trail and he just went crazy and came out. You know, doing the whole and I'm just sitting there looking at him. Said, he right. jumped up in the air. Yeah. He so jumped he, in the air and just... Oh. He probably didn't foul him, but the, the Rodney Odom was sitting right there, and then the other guy came in, and they probably still got Jordan's blood on the court there. And they probably had to carry, I don't know if he went back in the game. <laughs> they killed him. Well, uh, yeah, it was a technical foul, and even Troy, I'll never forget, Troy's over there telling Coach Cassis. Yeah, that... That kid lost in the game. Yeah, you did. That kid, down, I think he had cost them. two free throws on it? Yeah, he had cost them a couple of those situations. So yeah. it's a good thing to talk about, just be a pro. Wasn't that, who was the kid? I forget. Was it? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. We know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyhow, so I think I've thought of them. So awarding an unmerited free throw, awarding a merited free throw, counting, erroneously counting a score, uh, not counting a score, and then I thought of the fifth one so, uh, those are the four main ones, and uh, you have to catch it before the next day. Okay. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's great that you're giving us a picture of how officiating works on all these other levels. But I mean, the the what's going to be the most interest for our coaches are specifically with tournaments. Um, so my question would be with the formats that most tournaments use which are skewed from, from your normal, you know, no single bonus, double bonus at 10 free throws, the way the clock is run. Mm -hmm. um, two parts. First is, is there anything that, co that the officials are told um, as far as game management in order to keep the games within that time frame? Um, and and what, what would you, you know, offer to a coach specifically for the changes in the rules and the changes the way the game's administrated specifically for tournament play? Okay, good question. So I sign quite a few games, probably about 7,000 a year in the off season. In the games we assign, they are instructed to call fouls. You cannot let a game get out of hand. It doesn't matter if it takes two hours, okay? That doesn't mean the officials go out and actually do that. Most of them work four or five games a day, try to give them a break. But you're going into other tournaments, uh, and, and, and he brings up a good point. You have more fouls until you get the bonus. Um, uh, so as far as being a coach, again, just be approachable. Um, when you have disparities in fouls, I think that's when you have a bad situation. Um, sometimes you can have a disparity in fouls, and, they're, and, it's, and it's a real thing. But typically, a well-officiated game, the, the foul counts are right in line. Okay, uh, you should not have 10 to 1. You should not have 12 to 2. Okay, it can't happen. But I think the best thing to do in these tournament situations is to uh, focus on coaching your kids uh, to, to, to play hard and to not foul, uh, which is what you're going to do in a normal situation. Um, and uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Neil, but we, we stress that our officials, uh, everything's on film now. I mean, even you know, between the games, well, especially. A point that you might be asking about is if the clock doesn't stop. Well, it's, it's a couple of things. I mean, obviously, you know, the the way that the game the rules are changed for tournament play is so that they can make sure that they're they're completing games in an hour. Mm -hmm. But what that really does is it changes the game in that it rewards much more aggressive play. Right. Um, you're not going to be shooting your free throws until the end of the halves um, if you get to it at all with ten fouls. Um, with the shorter clocks and with the way the clock runs, it, it, it obviously gives a more aggressive team a, a greater advantage. True. Um, so <clears throat> with that in mind, what would, you, what would you offer for coaches as far as the officiating goes? Yeah, I, again, um, any perception that a referee is out there for the, for the you know, 20, 25, 30 bucks per game, we instill in our officials to not allow that to happen, but if you have plays that they're obvious fouls, again, that there are no whistles on, use the tools that you have as a coach. Uh, an extreme one is to call timeout and ask the, the official what he saw in a professional manner. Okay, hey, my kid's hurt. You know, can you stop play? Uh, uh, there's a way to approach the refs, um, and they should talk to you. They have to be approachable. Um, but if you've got fouls that are not being called, I think you have a job as a coach to 
to stand up for your team and, and say something. Tell the official what you're seeing over there. What does he have on the play? Okay. What do we have to do to get a foul on the play? Okay. I think if you go too extreme and insinuate that they're out there trying to get the game over with, you know, you'll run into a situation where you've got, you know. I think it goes back to, to also, what's, how's your relationship been the first 25 minutes of the game, 30 minutes of the game? And if you've been blasting in them, they may not want to talk to you yeah. in, the, in, the, in the heat of a game. Yeah. If the first 25 minutes you've been riding them the whole time, you know. It's a big thing. It's a big real thing. Again, coaches and officials, you do have guys. They won't talk to coaches. But I'm not going over there. I just don't want to talk to them. You know? That's not fair to a guy who's working hard over there. You have to be approachable. It's not an easy thing. Uh, I have conversations like this every week with officials. We got young ones, we got old ones, we got middle aged ones. And they all need to be consistent. Royce will tell you what's the first thing as a coach that gets you up is not being consistent, okay? Foul down here, same play down here, no foul. Wait a minute. You guys trying to score, same play, you don't have a whistle on it? I mean, and yeah, unfortunately there are officials, that they call them hom homers or leaners, okay? And they, they, they will flat out cheat. Uh, I have seen it. There are not that many of them, but it does exist. No doubt about that. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, I got thrown out of one game in, in high school. It was at Port Arthur. No, it was at uh, Bo Beaumont. And it was Beaumont. They both went to that high school. <laughs> the game we had, the playoff game, I mean, I, I, don't, I think two of them didn't play real well, but it was, uh, I forget who we were playing. The kid that was going to Mexico, he was real good. But that was a game. I, I remember looking at Pete Dagle and even Rusty. I said, I, I, I got it. Can't do anything. I didn't say it, but I was like, I can't change what they have. So you have to adjust as a coach a lot. Well, I will tell you this: you asked a question about your kids fouling. You know, when you... at this age, like in high school, I get it, right? But at this age, in sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I, I would hope that an official would say, "I called your offhand. You, know, you bumped him with the offhand, right?" Because sometimes my kids will do something and they they don't know what they got called on, right? Well, I'm going to so tell you, when, you're, when you're guarding, the coach when you're, when you're, your junior high officials that you, that this, that you mm -hmm. get, those are the beginning officials. What are you getting? I mean, you're, it's not consistent because when you're getting a, a first year coach, I mean, a referee, he ain't good for the most part. He misses a ton of stuff. So you just got to live with it and say, hey, you know, these kids are learning. But just, from being here in Kingwood for 33 years, watch, uh, coaching basketball. Take a Kingwood team, and you're playing against uh, North Shore kids, something like that. You're going to foul more. Athletic kids don't have to foul to play defense as much as, you know. It's not always the case, but I will tell you this, over the years, you know, you look up there and see that, see that we're, they're shooting fouls earlier than we are. When your kids are slower, <clears throat> they foul more to get places. And so that's just part of it. You know, you got to be more aware. And that actually brings up a great point. I mean, we're, we're obviously, we've got a lot of different ages of kids. We've got kids that are, you know, in, in high school, in middle school, kids that are still in elementary school. I mean, a big point of, of interest for a lot of the players and a lot of the parents is that transition in seventh grade when they get the opportunity to start playing for the school. So as coaches that are coaching kids in that age level, I mean, is there anything specifically that you would offer from an official officiating standpoint as to what we should be coaching these kids that are making the transition from weekend tournaments to, <clears throat> to school ball? Yes, I would, I would uh, the best advice I can give is obviously teach them the fundamentals, um, teach them how to respect the game, their players, their coaches, uh, their opponents. Those are big things, often overlooked, okay? But, uh, you know, <clears throat> you're getting good coaching now, okay? Uh, stick, stick to the basics. Go back to the basics. Basics if you start to struggle. 
you know, following through, how you pass the ball. These are all real routine things that, that you do, but they make such a big difference when you start playing organized basketball. Um, you know, you only have at the middle school level, you got what? Maybe do they play? Do they even break a twenty game season? No. Even with tournaments. 15. Yeah, 15, 14 games. With that said, to go out there and, and give every single minute you have uh, in those games because they're not that many. I mean, you go seventh grade, eighth grade, okay. And you got ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, where you're getting maybe thirty, maybe thirty-five games. I mean, if you make a real run, go to state, maybe forty. But um, so it's uh, you know, 120, 130 games in your career. I will say one thing that the big transition from fifth, sixth grader, seventh grade AAU to junior high basketball. You go to an AAU game in the summertime with six second grade kids, the score may be 75 to 70. Their first game in junior high, the score might be 38, 32, or 28 to 22. And the parents up there think that it's no coaching. Those guys are terrible. We scored 60 points in the summertime. We can't even score 35 in junior high. The big difference is, and there is a difference, you get them every day in junior high. You're coaching them every day in junior high. may not be a high level of coaching, but they're there every day, and the defense is just different. There's just no comparison. So there's, you know, just because they're not scoring a bunch of points in junior high, you know, the, de the defense is different. We, Absolutely. If I take my summer team and go score 80 points in the summertime, and then we play and take my same team in high school, we're playing on down there and the scores 38 to 36, you know, and it's a good game. You know, it just, it's just that's the difference right there. I agree, yeah. But just give it your all. Like I said, I've never really thought of it in this team. We've got 30 games. And Junior high and 30, 60, 90, you got 150 games maybe in your career. And if you're going into eighth grade, you got 115 left. 